Um, I, I will do the introduction now in English. So Matt uh, Burke is here with us from, from Bennett Institute of Public Policy in Cambridge. Uh, he and his uh, co-authors that I want also to mention, Patricia, Matthew, Moritz and Camiar, um, have re written this uh, uh, very relevant paper in our opinion, Rising Temperatures, Falling Ratings, The Effect of Climate Change on Sovereign Credit Worthiness. So, um, we from the Financial Innovation Division of uh, the Bank of Banco de España, we found this like a very, very relevant um, paper and we are happy that you accepted our invitation here to discuss it with us because in our opinion, it's a very good example of how uh, the new technologies can help uh, green finance to scale. Right? So we are working especially on this um, intersection between uh, new technologies and sustainability a lot. So I think that the, your use of a machine learning model uh, to replicate the rating, it's a very creative and powerful tool. Um, a very short uh, description of your study that I find it is very useful and I found it in your same paper. Um, allow me to say it because I think it's very interesting just in two lines. You are using artificial intelligence to construct the world's first climate smart sovereign rating um, and warn of climate driven downgrades as early as 2030. So it's not only that the methodology is very relevant in our opinion, it's also that you have um, a conclusion that it's uh, very um, uh, significant and powerful. Um, so also the message that you're conveying to the audience, it's also very, very relevant. Uh, more than ever than we are currently at the BIS, for example, I think that also the timing of your study is very, it's very good, you know. Uh, we are seeing the new publications on um, new methodologies for measuring climate-related financial risks, and also uh, another study from the BIS about the transmission channels of uh, climate risk into the banking sector. No? So I think that you add a lot of value here, and not talking about the banking itself, but another financial intermediary as the sovereigns. That from our side as central banks, it's also a very uh, part interesting one because uh, a lot of our exposures also from our same portfolios, etc., are to sovereign debt more even that um, corporate. No? So um, I think that within our bank, we you will also get a lot of uh, attention uh, from, from good people. Um, with uh, no further ado, just allow me uh, to also say thank you to the audience uh, and uh, Matt, uh, just for you to know that we have people from from the private sector, banks, uh, asset managers. We have people from NGOs, consultancies, universities, and also from abroad. We have uh, people from multilateral development banks listening to us and uh, public agencies. So it's a very diverse audience, uh, but don't hesitate to go technical because as I told you before, we have people from research also from our units. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's the moment to to get into the, into the research as far as we can. Um, as uh, we said at the beginning, please, uh, I think Matt, you, you want uh, questions to go real time. No, as, as you go, uh, people can raise their hand in uh, WebEx uh, and you will attend the question at that uh, point in time. If people want to just uh, write anything in the chat, uh, I, can write, I can read it, Matt, um, either at the moment or at the end of the session. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, if uh, if anyone has any questions at any point, just please interrupt. Yeah. So uh, with no further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, I will mute myself, but I I will be here listening. Okay. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Andre, and uh, many thanks for joining us today. Um, so we're really excited about this new research, and thanks to the Bank of Spain for inviting us and uh, and hosting today. Um, my name is Matt Burke and um, I'm going to present the research and again just if anyone has any questions just uh, please interrupt me on the on the microphone um, and then I can I can respond to any any questions okay so I'm going to go through the um, following sections I'm going to explain um, what the gap in knowledge is exactly and how we uh, go about uh, filling that gap um, then I'm going to go through the empirical framework, how we constructed the um, sovereign credit rating um, with a climate adjusted uh, model. And then I'm going to go through some of the key results and then just to, to summarise at the end. 
Okay, so um, one of my co-authors probably recognizes this graph as I've uh, stolen it from one of his slides. Uh, sorry, um, I think that I'm not seeing your slides. Um, I don't know if you are sharing it correctly. Or it's uh, only me. But... Yeah, just one second. Yeah. Okay. It's loaded. Okay. I see now. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. That should be fine now. Indeed. Um, okay. Great. So, um, so uh, yeah. So um, in this uh, in this graph, we we or in this uh, diagram, we demonstrate uh, what the gap that we um, that we intend to fill is. So the the blue boxes indicate things that we already know. So things that the research has already has already told us. Uh, so we have climate science and some excellent climate economy models. Um, we also have a long um, literature for sovereign ratings prediction, but we don't really have anything that uh, brings the two together. So this is what our central contribution is, is the, uh, is the green boxes. Um, so we take uh, Khan et al as our central um, uh, climate economy model and we produce a sovereign ratings prediction model that is influenced by the literature and that can also um, accommodate a uh, climate adjusted version and and then we produce our climate adjusted uh, credit ratings from this. Um, we also have to do some extra empirical work to produce some government performance indicators that are also um, climate adjusted. And once we have these three things in place, these three green boxes, we can then uh, estimate a climate adjusted cost of debt. So we're able to take these climate economy models, the sovereign ratings literature, and try to convert this into a measure for um, a measure that encapsulates climate risk. Okay, so uh, conceptually, then uh, perhaps a, a nice way of thinking about this is is that it's it's climate time travel. We effectively keep everything the same, except climate and its impact on the key macroeconomic indicators. Um, so everything else uh, stays constant, and we just ask how different our sovereigns rating our sovereign ratings will be uh, under this scenario. Um, how much will it cost? And then we investigate the policy implications um, along with this. Okay, so our empirical framework, in order to accomplish this, we need, uh, we need two things. So we need um, a reliable and accurate sovereign ratings model. Um, but then we also need to be able to estimate it with climate adjusted data. So we need to solve both of these problems in order to um, produce our outcome. Um, and the problem is, is that um, for a long time, the literature for sovereign ratings prediction has relied heavily on parametric methods. So using linear regressions or uh, logit probit models. And there wasn't really very much else there that um, enabled us to try to answer this question. And some of the primary problems we encountered was that we weren't able to um, achieve a uh, accurate enough model that we could then uh, climate adjust and produce reasonable outcomes from. Um, and part of the reason why this is, is because sovereign credit ratings just aren't really very well suited to uh, linear modeling and um, they're naturally uh, non-linear themselves. So uh, movements up and down the sovereign rating scale don't necessarily equate to uh, equally meaningful increments in creditworthiness. Um, so this is the problem that we faced. You, know, you could move um, between the top ends of the scale and not experience much of a difference and move between investment grade and non-investment grade and um, experience a big change in your creditworthiness. So this is uh, the problem that we needed to overcome. Um, and the primary solution to this was a handful of re relatively recent papers that use nonlinear modeling and particularly machine learning algorithms 
to not only solve sovereign credit rating prediction, but there were also others that uh, measured credit risk more generally in corporate settings and in um, and uh, bankruptcy. Um, so we we adapted these models for our our purposes, and, and I think our major improvements really are our ability to integrate climate economics uh, meaningfully. Um, but that also, in order to do this, it had to be an extremely parsimonious model. Um, so this is also a, a significant success behind this uh, behind this um, this empirical approach. Um, so what did we choose? Now we, we we decided to move forward with a random forest algorithm, and and the reason behind this was that literature in the past had previously used it and had. Um, more success with this approach than it had with other machine learning algorithms. So, um, uh, so a range of different. So there's a handful of papers that had compared different approaches and and ident identified that random forest produced the most accurate outcome. So for us, it seemed like the most obvious thing to do. Um, as is common with these uh, algorithms, they handle nonlinear nonlinear problems really well, and uh, due to some recent improvements in the literature, we were also able to adapt it so that we could produce rating ranges. Now, statistically, these aren't really that much different from just a confidence interval. So when we produce a ratings outcome, we produce a range of outcomes, which produce a single one. And we can take the mean of these outcomes and then we also get some dispersion so we can be uh, more or less certain about what the actual outcome is. Um, and this is also interesting because it enabled us to stay quite close to the actual practice of ratings assessment. And we weren't just producing a single classification, we could produce um, a number that sat between certain ratings and we could also produce a range as well. So this was a particularly useful tool to use and it, and it, it replicated um, quite closely the actual practice. Okay, so once we'd identified the tool that we wanted to use, we then had to um, identify the variables. And um, ordinarily in the literature, the goal is to predict as best as possible. And that tends to be where people stop. Um, either that, or we want to know which factors are more meaningful in the prediction or less meaningful in the prediction and so on. And with using these algorithms, it's not necessarily the hardest thing to produce a really accurate model. Um, it becomes more complex when you need to produce an accurate model that you can then adjust for various climate scenarios reliably. Um, so in the literature, uh, an algorithm of this sort is typically estimated with something like 15 to 20 factors. And these can be a range of things. So um, default history is perhaps an obvious factor to use. Um, various government stability, uh, infrastructure, transparency metrics can also be used. And we didn't necessarily have the luxury of being able to do this because there is no feasible way to produce climate adjusted versions of all these different factors. Um, so we had a bit of a problem. We had uh, climate adjusted GDP, which is taken from uh, the literature. Um, but we needed more data to enable a robust and accurate assessment of um, of the ratings. Okay, so what we relied on at this stage was we'd got our GDP data from the climate economics models, but then we needed more climate adjusted um, or variables that we could adjust for climate um, to also estimate our sovereign ratings prediction. And for this, we relied on a, a piece of research produced by Standard & Poor's that assessed the impact of natural disasters on various government performance indicators. And this was really useful because what they did was they used um, or they took simulations from a, say, for instance, a one in 250 year uh, tropical storm on GDP and looked at how much, um, how much loss it led to for GDP. Um, they could then um, produce meaningful um, associations between the loss in GDP and uh, the government performance indicators. 
So all we did to this was um, we used this data and uh, had fit a function around this. So had produced our own measure using all of this data of association between losses in GDP and the government uh, balance variables. Uh, so this was like a, a little a little pot of gold for us really in that it, it gave us um, a meaningful connection between um, GDP data and the impact on these um, on these other uh, variables. So perhaps um, an easier way to visualize this is is with this graph. So on the right hand side we've um, got all the variables that we included in our model. So we have the ones in bold, the GDP and, and the nominal growth rate, which we can take from uh, climate economics uh, projections. Um, but then we also had these uh, other variables, um, which are commonly used in the assessment of sovereign credit ratings and elsewhere in the literature. And we were able to um, estimate the values of these variables by uh, fitting um, a function to the relationship between these variables as given by Standard & Poor's. So on the graph, you can see on the x-axis that we have GDP per capita as a percentage in loss and the association it has with uh, net general government debt. And the dots on this graph indicate the data points taken from the table provided by Standard & Poor's. And all we did then to this was to uh, fit a function where on the right hand side of the equation we have GDP per capita and on the left hand side of the equation we have uh, the general government debt. And it seemed obvious once um, we plotted this that there was a, a relationship between these that we could model with something really simple just like a, um, a polynomial and we could then take this function and apply it to the GDP data that we had um, from the literature and, and produce our own values for these variables. So, sorry, Matt, I, I'm going to interrupt you because you, yeah. you allow us to do it. Eh? So, yeah, yeah. Um, this, uh, in the previous slide, you, you mentioned this relationship with uh, that you found this, this code code no, that you found from this uh, SP report. Um, but yeah. that's referred only to physical risk because you mentioned that they, they try to do the simulation with the natural disasters. So if they are only referring to physical risk or somehow they also include transition risk. No, uh, that's yeah. Yeah. no, sorry, yeah, that's right. It's um I perhaps should have mentioned this at the start that yeah, this this paper this is is focused exclusively on physical risk. Um, okay. So okay. We're, we're trying to uh, find ways of integrating transitional risk, but at the moment we're um we're just solving the physical risk uh, problem with this. Um, so yeah, so we repeat this process for each one of these four variables that aren't in bold and we produce a function and then we can uh, reproduce new values for these variables for our climate and um, our climate scenarios. Okay, so this is then what our data looks like. So we have 108 countries, we have this time period and we chose to model uh, or calibrate our model based on data from 2015 onwards. And this um, seemed like a reasonable thing to do for a few reasons, mainly because it was a period of relative stability um, compared to maybe uh, the previous time period. Um, we would also then maybe suffer less from outliers from um, sovereign ratings downgrades as a result of the financial crisis and so on. And, um, and this gave us a slightly more accurate model. And we chose these variables again based on uh, almost out of necessity really. These were the things that we could um, adjust for for climate change. And we can take this data and then we um, we can calibrate our random forest algorithm. So once we're able to establish that we can produce climate climate adjusted versions of these variables, we can then start to build this uh, build this algorithm. And the underlying objective of this algorithm is just to split the data. Um, so we have um, a range of countries with different sovereign ratings and a range of features, which ideally will will describe these um, 
describe why these describe the variation in these ratings um, as best as possible. And um, we split the data by selecting the values of given variables that best split it. Um, and in a normal um, parametric sense, this split is done in a way that minimizes variance that produces a least mean squared error. Uh, so in a way, these these tools are not really all that different from ordinary ordinary approaches uh, to this problem. They just have a couple more advantages that come along with them that enable us to get more of the advantages and less of the drawbacks in a way. And this splitting process just keeps going until we're no longer able to um, achieve uh, more of a split or we have a category, a ratings category that has uh, five observations inside of it. So we calibrate our model this way and with a little bit more detail um, the specifics of the model is that it's 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 termed a regression forest so it runs like an ordinary regression might do uh, but with a decision tree algorithm as well so it's called a random forest because we actually produce many individual decision trees and in our case we produce 2000 and each tree operates as its own entity um, so each tree is randomly assigned a uh, marginally different subsample of our original data set and this is done with replacement and then each tree on its own with the data it has attempts to explain as much of the variance in the sovereign ratings um, allocation as possible and it does this by splitting the data up as much as it can and we can't just allow the algorithm to choose the best split from all six variables because perhaps unsurprisingly it might be that GDP per capita provides the best split in all scenarios and in which case we would just get the same answer. So what we do is we take two of our six variables for each split randomly and the computer decides which one provides the best split out of the two that have been randomly selected. And this process keeps going until it hits the stopping criteria uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide. That is, no further split can be achieved, or we have a ratings classification that has five, um, five ratings in it. So this is a, a, the detail of, of how the uh, algorithm is, is calibrated. And I mean, I, I think a forest and tree is perhaps a nice enough um, analogy on its own, but I, I quite like to think of this in terms of uh, having pinball machines. Um, so once we've calibrated our, our trees, and we're then trying to actually estimate the outcome, it's almost as if each outcome is a single pinball that gets pushed into one of the two, uh, each of the 2000 trees. And each of the pinballs, pinball machines are slightly different. They're calibrated slightly differently. One of them tilts slightly to the left, the other one tilts slightly to the right. And this is determined by the, uh, the randomness of the data that's been allocated to each, each pinball machine or each tree. Um, so they each produce a slightly different outcome. And then we take the average outcome and that produces our, our estimate. And this really is the central benefit that underlines random forest estimation in that we benefit from having a, uh, the opinion of 2000 slightly different models rather than the opinion of one single model, which could suffer from overfitting or, or a range of other empirical problems. And uh, popularly, this is described as sort of, um, imagine having a single weather forecast versus having many weather forecasts. Uh, you sort of you get an average in effect and you get a more reliable reliable outcome this way so at this stage what we do is we just test the accuracy of our model so at this stage we we've not done any of the climate adjustment yet we've just plugged in the variables from our panel data set and we're assessing the accuracy so on the x-axis, we have the actual uh, rating that is assigned to the 
country. And on the y-axis, we have the estimated rating from our model. And the black line indicates a one-to-one -one relationship. So the black line is useful in this graph because proximity to this line indicates accuracy for that particular observation. Now, one of the more interesting empirical anomalies that we get out of this data, and it, it, it adds um, credibility to our model, is that we improve in accuracy the further up the rating scale we get. And you actually notice this, it almost look, looks a little bit like a Nike tick, where at the bottom end of the rating scale, we get this almost systematic overestimation of the sovereign rating. And the reason for this is that the variables we pick, these you know, traditional classic econ macroeconomic indicators of performance, almost always um, predict the sovereign credit rating of highly rated economies better than they do of these um, lower rated economies. And it may be that the, 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 the library of other variables that the literature uses, such as uh, I mean, default history is a classic one, and, um, and transparency variables and government stability actually better predict these, these uh, sovereign ratings, but we just can't produce climate adjusted versions of these. So it's, it's a limitation of our, our research, but also it's, um, it's an interesting uh, observation to have that lends credibility, I think, uh, to our model. Um, so we produce the same thing here, but this time we've we've got a map to demonstrate it. So you can you can see how uh, a sample of our our uh, our countries uh, perform in terms of accuracy. The closer we are to dark green, the more accurate we are. And we don't have the full range of countries on this on this map. It's the out of sample estimates, so, um, depending on um, uh, which which one we've run. Uh, which algorithm we run um, will affect our um, our outcome for this. But you can see that, I mean, Argentina is a classical example in this uh, in this diagram that, you know, uh, we don't predict it very well. And this is to be expected because of its unique, uh, unique default history. Um, okay. Okay, so um, to put this together, then we we're now at a stage on this on this original uh, gap where we've got our S and P government performance indicators through our interpolation exercise, and we've got our sovereign ratings prediction model where we've borrowed bits and pieces from the sovereign ratings literature. Now we're going to produce our climate adjusted uh, versions of this, and to do this we're going to uh, look at it under three different warming scenarios so we use uh, the pathway rcp um, 2.5 uh, 2.6 sorry and um, this perhaps best tracks the commitments under the paris agreement uh, we also use rcp 8.5 which is characterized as the business as usual um, climate pathway and then we also use RCP 8.5, but with increasing temperature variability. So we get constant increases in temperature, but in this version, we uh, allow for the uh, variance or the variability of temperature to increase um, as well. Okay, so this is our first uh, results slide, and it's a similar uh, graph a similar depiction as before. So uh, along the bottom, we have the actual rating this country is assigned. Sorry, Matt, allow yeah. me to interrupt you because I was uh, receiving some questions and I think that the audience are posting the questions to the attendees, but not to all, all of us because we are panelists. So I was not reading them, sorry, but I yeah. will try to recap three questions we had, okay? And, and, and now on, please write the questions to everybody, not only to the attendees. Yeah. Uh, it's a web ex so, uh, from Jose Manuel Carbo, he was asking um, you, is there any specific reason why you have chosen 2003 instead of another number? Uh, 
And also regarding the calibration of the random forest, Jose, uh, if I understood it well, you chose 2015, 2019 to train your model, which period correspond to the out of sample? So yeah. a little bit of uh, the yeah, hyperparameters, the 2003 and calibration. Okay, yeah. So um, when selecting the number of trees, um, so this is a bit of a tricky one because, um, and it's it, it's open to um, uh, it's it's open to opinion, and and it's one of the things that you you encourage to uh, see how it plays out in practice. But um, as you increase the so say for instance in the in the extreme, if we only had a single tree, um, if we only had a single tree, then we would just produce the one outcome, and then we lose all the benefits of the idea of a random forest. And in that scenario. We're just we're just working with a decision tree. Um, what happens is when you increase the number of trees, you 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 naturally end up increasing the um, accuracy because you're minimising the error, and you're also um, reducing the uh, impact of overfitting. Um, so what I did was is I would just um, I would just run a series of, of of loops on this and just try to. Uh, there were a couple of exercises that. Um, that you can do where you observe the point where you just get uh, no more increasing returns from increasing the number of trees. So about 2000 trees, we get the least amount of error. Um, but after that, there's no, no additional benefit. Um, so that's the reason why we picked 2000 trees. Um, and the, uh, the out of sample. So we, we, we build the out of sample on a uh, 8 to 20 rule. And I just um, I use a very simple function in R to um, randomly assign a, a portion of the 2015 to 2019 sample, um, 18 and 20, and then that that makes up the out of sample. So I don't I don't go back in time before 2015 for the out of sample um, accuracy tests. If that makes if that makes sense, does that answer? I so, um, I think that Jose is writing me, but meanwhile, I have another question from, from Antonio Carre, SRB. Um, I think regarding the SP Godbot, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, the use of the elasticity estimated by SP and other variables are based on the previous economic recessions. How can you ensure that those elasticity will keep constant when the trigger of the GDP drop? come from a natural disaster or other event linked to the climate change. This might be a strong assumption that can limit the credibility of the model. Yeah, I think um, I think perhaps um, maybe one of my, um, my co-authors might be able to answer this in a bit more detail who helped uh, put this together. Um, but from my perspective, I think um, it's it, there's a little bit of a trade off here because where we're trying to produce an accurate and and parsimonious model, and and we have run versions of versions of this where we have just run or attempted to estimate with just GDP and its growth rate, um, and you know you, we get an interesting result out of this, but it's not convincing enough. So we need slightly more data, and the, the issue with this is that we have to make assumptions, and um, you know it's. It, it, it's always just trying to 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 handle that trade off, I suppose. Okay, let me yes, in case Matthew wants to answer a little bit later, I send him also the question. But uh, because I also had quite of the same question from from Maria Irusta from PBA about the um, how trustworthy uh, may be the use of um, this past data with no crisis uh, for this. Uh, estimation in the future so it's very much related to the same question um yeah sure um yeah. okay thank you very much so this, this is matthew agarwala one of um uh matt's uh co-authors on the paper um the relationships between these government performance indicators and the losses in gdp that we have pulled from s p's prior research uh, they are 
relationships that are estimated on simulations of natural disasters and sort of various stochastic shocks. You're right to point out that we cannot guarantee that those elasticities and those relationships will remain the same into the future, especially when we start seeing, if we start seeing um, ex extreme climate change and uh, sort of catastrophic runaway events. And for that reason, our results should be considered conservative lower bound estimates. And that if these elasticities become even greater, if the relationships become even more severe, um, then the downgrades would also reflect that. They would become more severe as well. Um, so we can't guarantee that those will be the same, but we are using the best possible information that is forward looking on the trajectory of the science, on the trajectory of temperature and precipitation, and the best possible economic evidence about how that might reflect GDP or how that might be reflected in GDP. Um, but this is a, a concern facing all climate research that the past may not be a very great predictor of the future if we go really far outside the realm of observed history. But I think it's, uh, it's fair enough that, that your estimation is a lower bound. Um, thank, thanks for the answer. Yeah, so, so then when we look at these estimations for, for 2030, and statistically we end up finding that the downgrades under the RCP 8.5 are uh, statistically significantly different from zero, um, whereas in panel B under the uh, RCP 2.6, we um, don't observe a statistically uh, significant difference. Even though the 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 change on the graph uh, appears um, appears appears much smaller, but so on the um, on the left hand side we have uh, these are both projections up to up to twenty thirty, and uh, the black line is the same as it is before, so it observes this unitary uh, relationship, and the uh, dotted line uh, indicates the the shift as a result of the temperature increase. Uh, the red dot on both of these uh, both of these uh, graphs represent Spain. Um, if we extend the time horizon up to uh, 2100, the, the difference between the two becomes much more pronounced. And uh, we, we Sorry, observe... Mike, you, you that the, the red dot is Spain? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I, I was also in the previous slide, I wanted to ask you because why, why it was not Spain on, the, on, on this uh, very nice visual global map? But I think that no. you put it here, no? Right. Yeah, so Spain is okay. on that map because it um, it fell on the out of sample for testing accuracy, but it does appear in okay. uh, in this version. Yeah, um, so uh, we observe a much more pronounced downgrade um, as a result of warming, and um, the the downgrade as a result of um, the RCP two point six hardly um, hardly changes at all over this time period. Um, we can demonstrate this also with uh, with a map with our full uh, sample of countries, and you can quite clearly see which uh, which countries experience the worst downgrades. And um, we go back again to this empirical anomaly where we observe some countries actually experience an upgrade. But the important thing to remember when interpreting this result is that uh, these countries already start very very low. And we know from our accuracy uh, tests that their GDP and these classical economic indicators overestimate their, their rating. So despite suffering from the effects of climate change, they still um, project to increase, but this has to be um, interpreted conservatively. Um, whereas the more um, highly rated economies uh, which we produce a much more accurate estimation for, we can be a lot more um, uh, confident about our result in this scenario. Um, so we repeat this analysis again, but this time we uh, allow for temperature volatility 
And what we notice in this scenario is a much more pronounced uh, downgrade in the ratings, even just in the next 10 years, and, uh, and a much more modest uh, downgrade if we follow the RCP uh, 2.6 pathway. And again, with uh, projections up to 2100, this um, this on this difference only increases much more greatly. And again, with with each of these graphs, we observe the data points, but we also observe these these ranges. And these ranges are graphical representations of the different estimates that each decision tree produces. So the point in the middle is the is the average outcome and it represents the range so when that range is really quite tight then all 2000 trees have produced a very very similar answer and when it's much much wider um, they produce much more variable answers and when we estimate this um, when we estimate this random forest algorithm with only the two variables that we get from climate economics we don't get a too dissimilar pattern in the mean but we tend to get much more variability so these whiskers get much longer okay so once we've established that we have these uh rating downgrades we can then take sorry uh, sorry sorry Matt. um yeah. bother you again in the previous slide because um uh, you mentioned at the beginning the the s p etc but um, um how do you account for this uh, change in the volatility in the um, in the um, rcps um uh, this is the climate economics uh, uh, module that you mean uh, is, uh, are they integrated assessment models if uh, i remember correctly what you use here or how do so you account for the impact of vol temperature volatility on gdp per capita and gdp growth so we rely on, into their random forest. Yeah. Yeah. So we rely on outputs from projections from Khan et al. And um, these represent scenarios where we get not only an increase in the uh, temperature, but that the temperature is also allowed to increase in volatility. And we get GDP projections um, that are different from the GDP projections where uh, we allow constant temperature variability so these just come as outputs from the model and i mean perhaps um perhaps cam might um might disagree with me here but i think it's an interesting observation and perhaps it, it, it demonstrates uh, an economy's readiness to respond when we get an increase in temperature um versus not only an increase in temperature but wide swings in that temperature um on a regular basis and actually our readiness to handle that sort of scenario is, 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 is much less than it is when it's just constant temperature increase. Um, so I think that's perhaps the interesting interpretation from this. It's very, very, very interesting. Um, in fact, um, at the Bank of Spain, we also host a seminar with um, Gonzalez, that is, uh, is another researcher that is studying, in fact, the, the the trend behind the global warming. No, I have here where he mentioned us that it's not only about the, the two degrees uh, on average uh, warming, it's also about uh, how different it is in the different quartiles of the distribution, no? and how the minimum, for example, uh, temperatures are increasing more than the average and the maximum. Um, and also he studied about the volatility. So I, I'm, I'm positively surprised uh, to see that some EM, some integrated assessment models are already able to to handle these other parameters. So, um, positively surprised. So I, I completely agree with you. Uh, it's it's uh, very interesting to, to be able to tweak a little bit this, this parameter. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting observation. And I think perhaps we observe um, uh, an increasing amount of uh, subjective um, or qualitative um, accounts of this uh, more and more. I mean, particularly, the uh, the issue in in in, in Texas with the, with snowstorms, you know, and the, the the people there are just not not adapted to to handle this, and this, you know, naturally um, uh, prevents issues for uh, presents issues for um, economic activity. Um, 
so yeah so with this we when we produce these climate induced downgrades we can then estimate using um, other research that produces coefficients on the impact that it has on uh, cost of debt so we can uh, take our, our downgrade data and, and, uh, and produce a metric for how much it will increase uh, a country's cost of debt by. So we take our two scenarios, our, our 2.6 and 8.5, and two different samples for each, uh, look at G7 and the full sample. And we look at their outstanding debt in billions, and then using their, uh, taking the climate-induced downgrades and, and taking inference from the literature we can estimate additional costs of debt on an annual basis, um, a lower and upper bound. And uh, you can clearly see that the, uh, the difference between these two is, is really quite, quite striking. Okay, so um, to summarize, I think perhaps one of our central achievements in, in this research is that we've tried to stay as true to the climate science as possible and um, almost breaking breaking from the uh, implementation that we ordinarily see with these algorithms which is to use an extensive number of features to estimate them with we've managed to produce a, a, a really quite accurate um, um, model with relatively few factors and this has enabled us to stay as true to the climate science as possible um, we can also say that Paris commitments reduce downgrades and when we look at the costs of this it, it naturally presents an argument that delaying any green investment only serves to in increase a, yeah, a future cost of sovereign debt. Um, so that's that's our research and thank you again for, for listening and I'd like to invite anybody who has any questions or comments. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. I, um, I don't know if we have any question. Um, I will just give a few minutes. If not, meanwhile, I, uh, out of curiosity, I have one uh, uh, question. Uh, have you faced the, the research to any rating agency? Because I think it's, uh, um, on the one hand, it's, um, it's um, very interesting to see that uh, with such a person managed model, you are able to replicate quite well the results. Uh, but also, it's very interesting to see that rating agencies, in my opinion, they it's also so that they really produce um, a valuable outcomes. I mean that their their decisions are not such linear, and and their credit committees, etc. They they have sense, right? So it's not an easy job what they have. So. Also, uh, reverse engineering, uh, when you have to use a random forest to replicate their decision, should also be quite a, a, a compliment to their job, right? So I don't know uh, if, you, if you have received any feedback from rating agencies about, uh, about your approach. Um, yeah, we've received um, some feedback from, uh, from Fitch ratings on this work, but um, I, I don't know much more about the, the detail of that. I think maybe Matthew uh, may know more about this. Um, I don't know if he's able to to respond to that. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we, we've, we've had uh, really quite positive feedback from ratings agencies, finance ministries, and, and from uh, a couple of your central banking colleagues from around the world. Uh, I think it wouldn't be appropriate to name the individual companies and attach it to the statements that, they, that they've given. Um, but uh, generally, what we've found is that um, from the ratings agencies, they say that this could well be a, a pretty substantial step forward uh, in the approach to assessing climate risks uh, within sovereign ratings. Um, of course, there are still other components that enter into the sovereign rating, which we have excluded here. Things like the political situation, um, things like the likelihood of social unrest. Um, and those are important. And the relative importance of, for instance, the political situation in assessing the uh, sovereign rating varies across countries. 
So you can have quite a bit of political dynamism in the United States or the United Kingdom that doesn't affect too much the sovereign rating. But for a country such as Iraq or Argentina or whatever, the political situation is a much stronger variable, uh, a much a variable that carries much higher weight in the ratings estimation. Um, and so what would be ideal is if we can start to factor in some of these other components of ratings as well. Um, the innovation that we need to make that happen is to understand how climate change will impact things like the political situation of countries or the likelihood of climate refugees. Um, once we have that, we can incorporate it. Um, Ah, there's a question about the uh, the SSPs. Um, so the SSPs enter into, so these are the shared socioeconomic pathways. They enter into our research um, insofar as they impact the results coming out of PAN et al 2019, that, that core macroeconometric model that we use as the basis for the impacts on GDP. Um, we have other work that we are starting on now to try to develop better pathways, um, particularly for the business sector as well, that are perhaps that contain more relevant variables, uh, but that's not included into, into the present paper. And also, Matthew, I think that uh, this question also raises a, a quite a, a good point, maybe for part of the research, nobody would be, or how I read the question also, the. The nexus, the Finnish nexus, uh, the sovereign banking nexus, right? Um, also, when you when you move uh, the climate adjusted rating uh, down, um, I don't know what will happen with the corporates and financials because of this uh, famous nexus that we learned in the previous uh, 2008 big crisis. So I, I don't know if this is something you already accounted for, but it's also something maybe to think about it in the future. No, uh, how everything is interconnected. Um. Well, Matt, do you want to take that one or, or shall I? Uh, no, you can, you can take that. Sure. Okay. Well, um, we do actually calculate the knock-on effects of the downgrades and the sovereign rating onto the corporate ratings uh, as well. That is included in the paper. And we show um, that uh, for, for some countries, these can be, well, first of all, we calculate the effect of the sovereign downgrade on the annual interest payment uh, of sovereign debt. And in, for that calculation, for some countries, the impact can be pretty substantial, right? For the United States, it's about a 25% increase in the annual interest payment. Um, we then calculate the effects spilling over onto corporate ratings and the cost of corporate debt. Um, for this, the data set is smaller. The sample is only 28 countries because that's the set of countries for which we had data from the Bank of International Settlements. Um, it's a relatively smaller impact, but it's still there. So this isn't just something that should be concerning sovereigns. It should also be concerning corporates as well. Um, there's a question I see in here from Antonio about uh, why about the cardinal estimation and the non-linearities in, in, in the ratings. Um, and that's a brilliant point. One of the reasons that we see higher downgrades at the top end of the scale is because essentially the importance of a downgrade from AAA to AA plus in terms of its impact on debt and impacts on markets is relatively small compared to the uh, one notch downgrade that puts you out of investment and into speculative grade, right? So the, the response to a downgrade depends on where along the scale you are. And so that's why we may see slightly more notch downgrades at the higher end. So I hope that answers the questions. To Matthew, I think I think you did it uh, and very well. And also uh, Matt, I don't know if there is any other questions. If not, I think we are uh, um, very perfectly reaching the one hour. So if if not just 
Uh, yes, there's another question, uh, Mr. Um, Cargo. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he's raising the hand. I think that has been because he was the one asking you, Matt, about the run forest. I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I already, yeah, Andres already made a question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It was about the run forest. Uh, so, Josmanel, you can put down the, the hand, I think. Sorry, sorry. That will help. Uh, so, anything else from our side? I think Matthew, Matt, Camiar. And I read uh, your your, your um, comments in the chat. Thank you all of you. As you may have seen, this is a very interesting topic also from our side. A uh, lot of implications also for uh, audio management, financial stability, a, a lot of angles. Uh, so congratulations for your piece of work. I think it's, uh, it's brilliant. It's very creative. Um, there are some um shortcuts potentially uh, but also a so very powerful message what you have got uh, so it's uh, uh, brilliant um so um, thank you again yes uh, for being here with us yeah we'd like to say thank you for you know, the opportunity to present here and uh, and it's the feedback and comments really useful for us to um for us to to move forward with the research Perfect. Um, I don't know if you will share the, the slides with us. Um, yeah, after, I can, yeah, after yeah. webinar. Okay. Perfect. So again, thank you very much, and and congratulations also because of all the feedback that you're receiving from many sites and your work. Um, uh, thank you again, Matt. Thank you, Matthew. Um, hope to see you in the near future again for extensions of this work. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Bye. you all very much. Have a wonderful day. Bien final. Hasta aquí. Adiós y muchas gracias.